currently working as a colorectal cancer surgeon and a breast cancer surgeon in Apollo Hospital, Bandagata Road. Today we will be discussing about the colorectal cancers. To begin with, let me give you a briefing about what a cancer is. We have normal cells that divide in an orderly fashion in the body and it all is a controlled manner. Uh, the worn out of the damaged cells are taken out of the system. Uh, but in cancers, what happens is that this uh, controlled manner is lost and the cells overgrow and they take over and the cancer would be named according to the organ that it is arising in. So now today that we are discussing about the colorectal cancers, let me tell you that the colorectal cancers would be divided into the cancers that arise in the colon or the rectum or the anus. Anus is the terminal passage through which we pass the stools. Now why do we need to discuss colorectal cancers? We know that we have certain screening programs running in our country that are for breast cancers, cancers and the cervical cancers. Although the colorectal cancers also are number four for females uh, as well as males in our country. And uh, looking at the new census, we see that uh, the numbers are increasing in our country. And the uh, Theravanantapuram and Bangalore are having the highest numbers as far as men are concerned. And for fem uh, females, it's uh, the Aizwa district of the Northeast. Uh, coming back to our main uh, topic, the colorectal cancer can be divided into the cancer that arise in the colon, the rectum or the anus. Now why um, I am stressing upon colorectal cancers is because 9 out of the 10 colorectal cancers can actually be detected, if detected in the early stage by uh, the proper screening programs can be treated very well. And we see that uh, nowadays the numbers of the cancer patients that are detected earlier and can lead a very normal life is increasing because of these screening programs. Hence the need to introduce the screening program for the colorectal cancers as well. Uh, how, how does this cancer start in the colon? Uh, well actually we, have, we are having two types of the polyps, a small ingrowths in the, in the inner surface of the colon or the rectum that start as a polyp and uh, they can gradually grow and can uh, develop into cancers. Uh, we have hyperplastic polyps and we have adenomatous polyps. Although the hyperplastic polyps are just the inflammatory polyps, but the adenomatous polyps can gradually over the period of time actually uh, turn into ca cancer because they are precancerous lesions. So now if we do a screening at that level, we can pick them up in that stage and just by minimal invasion or gastro, the gastroenterologist can do a polypectomy and can then remove those adenomatous polyps and uh, we can prevent them from becoming big cancers which would require bigger procedures later on. Uh, how do we screen? We have different ways of screening this cancer. Uh, we can go for a physical examination to a, a specific dedicated colorectal surgeon. Uh, we can get the digital rectal examinations done, a per rectal examination what we call. We have small instruments that can be inserted uh, into the anal region, the area through which we pass the stool and we can examine that part and see if we look for any uh, abnormalities in that region. Then we have the fecal uh, ochre blood test in which the stool of the patient is analyzed and we see whether there are traces of the blood in that and then we can uh, evaluate further on for that. Now what is the right time to start the screening? The right age to start screening for colorectal cancers would be 50 years of age. Now what are the symptoms? Many patients would uh, want to know what are the symptoms for the colorectal cancers. Uh, it can start with like, bleeding in your stools, you can find some blood in the stools or your normal habit of the passing stools would be changed. Like they, there is altered, what we call an altered bowel habit. For example, if you are normally passing once a day or twice a day or once in three days, that uh, routine gets changed. You might get constipated or you might get more frequent stools or patients might feel that they are going for evacuations but there is a sense of incomplete evacuation. You need to go again and again uh, to pass the stools. And uh, some patients might feel uh, a little bloated up. There might be some abdominal pain, although the abdominal pain is actually in the later stages of the disease. Some patients are just evaluated randomly for a decrease in their hemoglobin level. The blood levels drop, so they are being evaluated for that. If the growths are on the right hand side of the colon, the right sided colonic growths are actually presenting in that form only. The patient would be just evaluated, would go from pillar to post to be evaluated for that uh, drop in the hemoglobin. While later on they find after say a year's time they find out that there had been actually a growth in the colon that was missed. And so there will be weight loss, there might be weight loss associated with the disease. 
All these symptoms may be associated with colorectal cancers or any other cancers, but colorectal cancers can also present in this form. Patients might be having piles for years together or for months together and they get, go from pillar to post, get evaluated for that, get treated by the quacks without actually being evaluated for the main reason causing that. It's not that every pile or hemorrhoid would be harboring cancer, but every pile or hemorrhoid after the age of 45 to 50 needs to be evaluated because cancers in the rectal region can present as piles. Patients might need to know what are the groups that need to go for screenings. One is that any patient above the age of 40, 45 or 50 who is having these altered habits or the symptoms that we discussed should go for evaluation. At least a minimum of flexible sigmoidoscopy is needed to be done. Then uh, people who are actually chronic smokers, people who consume alcohol very frequently, then uh, people who are having sedentary habits or whose intake of red meat is on the higher side rather than the fibers, and people who are having family history of the colorectal cancers or breast cancers or uh, endometrial cancers. Uh, patients who are being having a personal history of what we call inflammatory bowel diseases, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, they are at a higher risk of having this cancer. And patients who are already running a genetic uh, disorder in the family who are having what we call FAP syndrome in the family or HNPCC wherein there is history of the colon cancers in any of the first degree or second degree relatives in the family either on maternal side or paternal side. Then uh, patients also who are having a uretro sigmoidal anastomosis for any other surgeries being done in the past or uh, uretrocolic anastomosis and uh, patients, uh, in fact, the group of the patients who have been on long immunosuppression for any other transplants, for transplant surgeries, they are also being uh, seen to have a higher risk of uh, having colorectal cancers. Uh, although the relative risk would be equal to the population, but they would have the cancers uh, a little earlier in the age group, 20 to 30 years earlier than the normal population. Then patients who are having diabetes mellitus, which is dependent on insulin, which is, uh, sorry, resistant to insulin, they are also uh, seen to have a slightly increased risk of the cancers because of the insulin-like growth factors working in. Uh, then the patients who are having any uh, androgen deprivation for any other cancers like prostatic cancers and they undergo orchidectomies, those, uh, pop that subpopulation is also uh, having a slightly increased risk than the normal population. Or if the patient is having a prostatic cancer and has had irradiation, radiation as a treatment for that, that subgroup also has an, a slightly increased risk of these cancers. So these are or the patients who are having HIV, uh, human immunodeficiency syndrome. So these are the patients who are advocated to start the screening a little, uh, earlier in the age group. Otherwise, 45 to 50 with any uh, blood in the stools, any abdominal symptoms that can uh, hint towards the colonic uh, disease or uh, any altered bowel habits that last for more than a week, they should get evaluated. Now coming to the test that we need to diagnose, uh, starting as we said, uh, other tests that we use for screening as well, physical examination, we take the medical history of the patient, we do a digital rectal examination of that area, we do a proctoscopy in the outpatient departments, we can do a full-fledged colonoscopy. Why a full-fledged whole-length colonoscopy is required is that uh, around 4-5% to of these patients would be having a synchronous lesion anywhere else in the colon if we find a lesion in the rectum or sigmoid or anus. Then uh, if we have found a suspicious lesion, we can take a biopsy of that lesion and confirm or refute the diagnosis. Uh, for screenings, we are doing this through local blood. Uh, we can do uh, what we call a tumor marker, which is CEA. That CEA is not diagnostic as such, but it helps in the prognostication and it helps us when we are giving treatment to that patient to see whether the patient is responding, how good is the patient responding, and in follow-ups to see whether there is any recurrence or metastasis later on. So uh, now that we've diagnosed the disease, what would determine the outcome or the prognosis of this disease? Uh, the first thing would be the stage at which we have diagnosed this disease, whether it was stage 1, 2, 3 or 4, whether it, it, it was localized, it had spread to any other parts of the body and if it had spread to any other part of the body, what was the bulk of the disease that was, in a, uh, that was found in any other part of the uh, body? 
Why it is important for the collateral surgery specifically is because this is uh, the most commonest GI malignancy in which we do surgical resections and in which even if the disease has gone to some other part of the body, uh, what we call a stage 4 disease, we are still able to prolong the survival of those patients if the uh, burden of that spread is on the lower side, we can reset whether it has gone to lung or liver or any other part, we can uh, take that also out and increase the survival of that, uh, that patient. And now, uh, which part of the, uh, uh, this intestine is having that cancer would also determine the prognosis. For example, generally we say that the cancers on the right hand side are having uh, uh, the poor prognosis and the chances of recurrence later on. Then uh, whether the, uh, the other thing that determines what would be the outcome is uh, whether the patient when he presented was having any kind of obstruction or whether that tumor had actually perforated or ruptured because if the tumor had perforated then the spread to the rest of the abdominal cavity is more so the prognosis becomes a little poorer then uh, whether that uh, tumor we were able to remove what we call whether we were able to do an R0 resection at the time of surgery whether we were able to remove the whole of the tumor from the body is again what determines the outcome if we are not able to there, there is a part that stays in the body which we have not been able to remove because of specific reasons then the prognosis would drop and the general health of the patient whether the patient is having any other illnesses whether the protein levels were not good the HP levels were not good or the patient is having other comorbidities associated that also determines uh, what the outcome of the disease or the surgery is going to be it's now amazing. coming to the staging part, now that we have discussed that the, two, uh, the uh, surgery outcomes depend upon the stage at which we have found the disease, how do we stage this? We uh, do a local staging and we do a distance staging. For local staging, uh, we do an MRI that tells us the exact spread in the local area and we take a call whether to subject this patient to upfront surgery or whether to send him for a pre-surgery chemotherapy and radiation therapy to downsize and downstage the disease and to preserve the natural passage of the stool, the NS. And uh, if the tumor is very small in size, the staging can be done even with the endoscopic ultrasounds. For the distance staging, we have the CCT abdomen and thorax, uh, the CT that we do to see the spread in the lungs, the liver, rest of the abdomen, or nowadays we can also do a PET CT. The PET CT would tell us about the spread uh, from head to toe anywhere in the body. Now the next question the patients usually have, whom to see for our symptoms? For example, if we're having this bleeding per rectum, if we're having any uh, uh, bloating, or if we're having any uh, signs that show the obstruction in the intestines and all, whom do we see? Uh, for the initial evaluation, you can go to any general surgeon who can evaluate you for whether you have you are actually harboring the cancer or not. But if you're diagnosed with the cancer, the best person to see is actually a colorectal cancer surgeon if you are having one available around, because they are the they are the doctors who are specifically trained in how to deal with these diseases. Even for the benign part, they are the ones who uh, who are having a detailed training. Now how to go about the benign diseases as well as the uh, malignant diseases. So if you are having a privilege of having an access to a colorectal surgeon, he would be the first choice that you have. If you do not have, then the oncosurgeons or the cancer surgeons are the second best choice or the GI surgeons are the third best choice for any cancers related to the colon, rectum or anus.